Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 154 on growing a 1,000-plus unit portfolio within a 20-minute driving radius with Jason Perro. Jason lives in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is the opposite corner of Pennsylvania from where I grew up and still do a large number of deals right outside Philadelphia. The perspective to pay close attention to during this episode is the fact that Jason has built this portfolio in a small 20-minute driving radius of Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, which is a, a market population, maybe about 295,000 people, give or take. Uh, one of my own personal preferences in real estate investing is very large MSAs, Metropolitan Service Areas. Uh, with with like five to ten million people minimum. So like my theory is more houses and more deals. It just seems easier. Yet there is something to be said for a very well constructed, centrally located portfolio. Many of the benefits and the investment theory will be shared here by Jason today. Shall we begin? Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show, Jason Pirro. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Cool. So we are just about the end of March here, 2020, uh, coronavirus in the air and most of us shut down here. I'm in Chicago. Our city's under shutdown and, and it's happening, I'm sure, around the country. Uh, whereabouts are you for the listeners so they can kind of get a perspective and, and, you know, fill us in on what's going on there a little bit? Yep. I am in located in Erie, Pennsylvania. So that is the northwest corner of Pennsylvania. Uh, roughly an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh and an hour and a half uh, east of Cleveland and an hour and a half west of Buffalo. Nice. I uh, I used to live in Grove City. I actually graduated from Grove City High School. So right north, right south from Erie there. So believe it or not. And then I grew up in Philadelphia, so I'm a Pennsylvania guy my most of my life before I got to Chicago. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I went to school about 10 minutes from Grove City at Westminster. So... Nice. All right, far, cool. Yeah. So, so, Jason, for people who may not have already stumbled upon your name, uh, I know you're you're kind of a, a big player around the scene, uh, certainly a big player in Erie, Pennsylvania, in the real estate space, but could you give us kind of the Reader's Digest, sort of what your career looked like getting into real estate and what the business looks like today? Sure. Uh, so my wife and I, we bought our first real estate investment, which was a duplex, back in 2001, a week before 9-11. Um, we kept buying, uh, you know, we both worked in medical sales. She was a pharmaceutical rep. I was a medical device sales rep, um, kept buying property and she left her job in 2010. I was able to leave mine in 2012. Uh, at that time we had about 300 units. Fast forward to today, uh, we're at about, about a thousand units. Um, a third of that, which we've, we, uh, we've syndicated, you know, we're the sponsors and, and uh, key principals on a couple syndication projects. And uh, the other two-thirds of the portfolio, uh, we own ourselves with without any partners. Gotcha. So I'm, and, I'm – go ahead. No, no, I was just say everything we have is located in or around the Erie, Pennsylvania area. So um, currently still stuck in our own geographic location as well. Yeah, I guess there's a case to be made either way. I mean, there's a lot of people who come on my show, multifamily is a very popular topic, and it's, you know, kind of goes obviously one of two ways. Either people stick to the geographic area, can drive and, you know, check on the properties any given time of day or night from home within an hour or so, and then you have the other uh, type of operator who doesn't mind hopping on a plane and prefers the Texas, Florida, you know, certain other markets that are around the country for whatever reasons they're buying. So I, I always like to hear which perspective, you know, you're sharing from. I think that's important, um, you know, whether it's a backyard kind of investment strategy versus, uh, you know, the entire country and hopping on an airplane, which after what's going on lately, I don't know how excited people are going to be to jump on <laughs> airplanes, right? Jeez. Well, yeah, I know it, it is a crazy time. I mean, I, I'm definitely not opposed to that um, that method, but I but I say 
you know, our, our hometown has treated us very well over the last 19 plus years and, and um, in terms of investing. And, you know, we didn't know any difference starting out. I think these days, if, if somebody's getting into syndication as a business model, it, it's a much more clear path that, hey, I, I you know, you could buy property across, you know, all across the country and here's a, here's a method on how to do it. Um, you know what, we've, Erie served us well. I, I mean, I make the argument um, about, uh, about tertiary markets and, and uh, sometimes that, that, you know, they never really see the big booms and they never really suffer too mad, too badly under an economic bust. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll find out if those words ring true here in a few weeks, but, um, but I'm not too overly concerned about the business side of things taking a, uh, taking a hit here. Um, maybe some minor disruption, but overall, I think we're, I think we're in pretty good shape to weather the storm. Yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to agree. So let's let's back it up a little bit in the story here. Uh, you know, medical sales, pharmaceutical sales. I think that's kind of like a traveling gig, right? Is that kind of you're not home all the time, or did you have the ability to do that local? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, for the most part, most of those jobs don't require a ton of overnights. I mean, you're away for you know meetings every quarter or you know, a few times a year. And, and then, um, you know, in the, in the, my wife's job as a pharmaceutical rep, and I started out that, that side of the business too. I mean, you're, you're mainly just calling on doctor's offices. You know, you're home by mid to late afternoon every, um, you know, every day. And then, again, just traveling for training and, and business meetings and things like that. Um, you know, on the medical sales side, you know, we had to do some overnights. That a little bit larger of a sales territory. But nothing where, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as though, you know, you're leaving Sunday night, coming home Friday night. You're able to be home most nights for dinner. It might be later, you know, later than normal, but I uh, was able to kind of keep a, a reasonable enough balance back then. So, um, but there's a lot of windshield time, and that windshield time was the best time for me to, you know, listen to audio books, uh, call, you know, call our employees, you know, source deals, that, that type of thing. So I was able to use a lot of that to, to our advantage in terms of when we were growing the business. Nice. So of the 300 or so units you had at that point, can you give me a breakdown of like, I, I imagine, right, that some of them were a single family and then maybe you started getting into multi and then you started to kind of graduate toward one or the other. Or maybe I'm totally wrong and you're still buying single family to this day, but it would be helpful to understand kind of the progression as you start to put sure. together a thousand unit portfolio. Yeah. So at that time, that when we left the day job, there was a... um you know, we had a few like 30 unit type complexes had, uh, so all along we would, you know, we'd buy a, you know, a two unit, a four unit, um, didn't have much in the way of single family homes until 2008 when there was a glut of, you know, foreclosed properties that I saw I could buy a single family home for you know, 10 or $15,000 in, in Erie PA and we could, you know, we could put money into the, uh, you know, into fixing it up and then, and then have, you know, just build equity that way. So we, uh, you know, so there wasn't a, uh, um, not a ton of single family homes till later on, but, um, but yeah, it was just a, kind of a broad mix of like a few 30 unit buildings, a few 16 to 20 unit buildings, and a bunch of, you know, eight and 10 units, and then, you know, a whole bunch more of, of the singles and doubles. And was the philosophy at that time when you were putting them together, was it, you know, hey, I like the paper losses combined with the cash flow? Am I buying like and trying to raise rents and force values? I mean, what what was kind of going through your mind in the, maybe the first five years of putting that together? Well, the first, yeah. Yeah. The first five years, I mean, we were, I was just trying to. I was just trying to buy rental property. I mean, that's about all I knew. I mean, this is before. I don't, I don't want to say it was before the internet, but you know, 19 years ago, it wasn't. It wasn't like it was today. You know, there there was no Facebook. There was no Facebook groups. The you know, the real estate investing websites were were not that abundant. You know, and there were some real estate investing books, but I was just you know, we were you know buying a lot of the you know, duplexes, quads, that type of thing, and just yeah, really looking where hey, can I go in and raise the rents? You know, for some appreciation. I never wanted to sell anything, so I didn't care as much about the pre appreciation as I cared about the cash flow. And and the reason for the cash flow was at some point to be able to leave, you know, be able to leave my day job and um you know and have that be self sustaining for uh for, you know for my family and myself. Who managed back then and is it still the same way today? So when we started out, it, it was my wife and I. We would, uh, you know, she'll tell you I was I was probably the worst painter we ever had. So she would she would paint, <laughs> and we would, you know, and I really really was not handy. And that kind of forced us into, you know, as we grew, that that was a real like, you know, um, kind of kind of I'm not not eye opening, but you know, 
reassurance that we needed to grow so it could get me out of like fixing and painting and things like that. So, you know, I did the leasing, uh, you know, and, and we would we would rent them out. So the first several years we did most of that ourselves. You know, I'd, I'd throw the you know push lawnmower in the back of my a car and then you know go around and mow the lawns and stuff like that. So. Uh, 2005, I uh, met a guy who became one of my uh, biggest mentors in the business. But at the time, we had 23 units. He had 56 units, and we ended up um, purchasing those on. And he held the paper, so uh, we bought the property. He um, he held a mortgage for uh, for a little over, or right around a million dollars, and um, that kind of with that came our first maintenance guy. And when I realized, oh my gosh, there's all this work that we don't have to do, that we, you know, we can have somebody, you know, showing up every day, that was great. And then as, uh, but then, you know, that, that was the time I was transitioning into some more demanding medical device positions, and we, we started having our, you know, our, our had our first child in 2005. So just the demands of life got to be more too. So, um, you know, we hired a part-time property manager. You know, kept buying. You know, we kept buying real estate. So then that part-time manager went into a full-time manager. And, and so now, you know, all told, I've got, oh gosh, probably about on a given day, you know, between 22 and 24 employees um, between our office staff and maintenance guys and, and leasing agents and things of that nature. So um, we still, you know, my wife and I are more of a, like the CEO role now where we're really just calling the shots and making sure and we've always done that, but now it's just on a, on a much bigger scale. And, and so, um, having you know having a team of people um, when you're self managing it, I mean it's it's fantastic because you know you don't have you can remove yourself from some you know from all the day to day kind of nonsense and, and some some people really do love paperwork you know so you can hire a good office manager <laughs> to keep your paperwork straight. Some people really love numbers, so hiring a good accountant on staff or you know just so it, it it took me a while to realize that hey there's a lot of things that I know I need to do but I'm maybe not great at them. Well, how do I, you know, how do I grow to a point where I can fill that, you know, put that person on the right seat on the bus and, and keep keep going forward? Yeah, I think that's interesting. So to hear your story, Jason, you have this experience early on where, you know, you're buying the properties. It feels like a good idea. There's no bigger pockets. There's no all the stuff we have. Here. The podcast was not invented yet. I got in in 2006 and there was still none of uh, that kind of stuff around. You had to pay five, right. ten grand and go to a seminar or the real estate get riches kind of thing if you wanted any kind of yeah. info and to and then uh and then you you have this self managed experience. I think you know, I think that's probably helpful for a lot of people in the beginning because if you're not paying the guy to do the lawn mow and you're not paying, you know, the property manager the first month's rent, you're not paying the maintenance guy to do the paint and the turnover, at the end of the day you got a little bit of cash and you're kinda able to still go forward. Like my 25 or so units, which I treat as my kind of savings account, if you will. It's like, that's just like money in my savings. And at the end of the year, it's, it's kind of like break even. It's not really making yeah. any money. I mean, my equity is good and the, the money's there and there's tax benefits and stuff like that. But I have a property manager in place. I don't do the repairs. I don't do any of that stuff. And like, that's, that's probably the money that I'm missing that, that a, an investor would make early on. Now we did 223 deals last year in 2019 alone between like 14 partners that we have. Um, it's like 5 million plus in profit that we split up. So we're kind of busy doing that. And I'm like CEO role, president, managing all that activity there with my partners. Um, so I, I'm not counting on the rental income for my business. It's not my main business model. But I think it's also instructive and in telling for your story to have then gone from doing all those things yourself to like, you know, here comes the guy with the other 56 units. Now I need this, you know, other person to do the bookkeeping. And you're able to assemble this team of 20 plus people that allows you to grow to that thousand unit portfolio. I mean, would you, right. was it accidental? Did it just kind of evolve that way? Or were you very intentional about like putting a team together, knowing that you were going to grow to a thousand units or so? Well, I, the, the team, um, you know, that when we started self-managing, you know, I always had the goals that we wanted to to grow to a certain point, or we knew that we would grow the business in, in a certain way. Um, but it was organically. You know, I didn't just wake up and say, "Hey, I'm going to have 24 employees." I mean, you got to have the revenue to be able to support that payroll. So, 
you know, it went from two two employees to three to five and just kind of grew organically. And, and what I learned, it took me several years of learning, was just where are my pain points and where am I spending most of my, where, where am I wasting most of my time that somebody else could do better? And so, you know, as we've grown, I've just, now, now I'm trying to be very proactive. So, you know, we're closing a 127 unit uh, deal here in a few months. And I know that that's going to require some other layer in our, in our staffing. And where, where's that going to, you know, where's that need go, going to arise? Is it, is it maintenance? Is it, you know, management? Um, paperwork and, and where do we add or where can we, you know, where can we expand our uh, support staff in that, in that regard? So, I, I mean, now I, I'm very proactive about trying to identify our needs ahead of time and as we do deals and, and try to scale our team as we scale the business. And, and it's, and we've had a lot of luck with taking the, more of a proactive approach with it the last, uh, you know, the last couple of years. So I'm curious. So like I have the 20 some units and I own those exclusively, like meaning I have mortgages, but it's my money that was the down payment and there's no partners. I didn't syndicate any money to get that small portfolio. And you got to 300 and it was just your wife and you. And then you, you had like a third, I think you mentioned earlier here that are in syndications now, but then two thirds, I'm assuming that you had prior. I'm, I'm wondering why add the syndications now? Like for me, I always, we have investors who invest on those single family flips. Um, and I like the end date, you know, six months, 12 months, I pay them back. They give me the money again and it, and it, it moves forward. I always had a hesitation, me, ment- maybe a mental block of taking on syndications and then having eight, 10, 15, 20, a hundred different people whose money I had, and maybe it's just, you know, I'm scared to have other people's money for a longer period of time. I I don't want to be responsible. Maybe it's kind of a personal thing, but I'm curious uh, if you felt any of that and why choose to add the syndications after you kind of have reached a certain level of scale. Maybe you'd want to share your goals. It would help explain it maybe. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I definitely had some mental blocks of my own when I was thinking about syndication. I think back in maybe 07 or 08, I, I, started learning about it and I I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't wrap my head around, gosh, why would I want all these parts? To me, it seemed like there was these partnerships and man, why would I want to answer to 10 or 15 people and then, you know, or, or more. And it just seemed like, I I just didn't grasp the concept that, you know, the way, the way of of, of proper syndications can be done. And so as time went on, um, you know, I, I still kind of had these mental blocks about partnerships and syndications. And then, uh, about five years ago, I guess I, I met a guy who's who's a co-sponsor, co-GP on our syndications uh, with my wife and I, and, and uh, he's a, another prominent local business owner. Um, had done some real estate, but he, he was primarily a farmer and had some other business uh, business interests. Um, but you know, we we hit it off, and, and we knew we wanted to do something in real estate together. Uh, couldn't wrap my head around it, and I um, I woke up one day and I just you know, I, I realized that, um, you know, we can get into the types, the, the bigger properties, the, you know, not maybe nicer property, large multifamily um, portfolios that, you know, traditionally, you know, if it's just a mom and pop operator, they, they'd either sell off a bunch of property to, to come up with a down payment for that, say, $10 million project, or they would have to go borrow against everything and over leverage again to, to get into those big projects. Um, but I realized like, Hey, I, I can get ownership in this with, um, without having to put up all of my own money. Now I've invested on the passive side of all, of, all of our syndications as well, but I, I realized like, Hey, I've got the control I want. People are investing in me and, and our team. And so with, with our partner, you know, his CFO does our books, does our distributions. She's in charge of the money. And I've realized that like, wow, it's really great to have some awesome people on our team, um, that are better at some of this than I am. So, you know, like uh, people trust in, in my wife and I, they trust in our, our track record, our, our operations, our history, our reputation, and having, you know, having a partner that brings that, that kind of same thing to the table, you know, we're, it's, it's really a powerful combination. And, and so, um, so what I found is that, hey, we're able to, gr- we're able to grow into a larger, uh, you know, larger and better properties without having to risk everything ourselves you know we're able to share some of that risk um but but at the same time grow, grow the way we want to, we want to grow and and you get into some of that larger property too it is a little bit more stable and predictable than you know um i mean like a 100 unit complex is going to be far more predictable and 
stable than a hundred single family homes. And, you know, less roofs to worry about, less, less furnaces, less, you know, electrical systems, like, like all of that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's just, it, it, what I like after doing this for so long is that predictability. I mean, maybe the return is a little bit less, but I know month over month or quarter over after quarter that I'm able to, you know, that we're, you know, we're able to like, kind of have that like predictable stream of income as opposed to having, you know, uh, maybe volatility or, or work that has to go into it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, when I look at your business model before and then the progression, when we talked about how you kind of built that management team, it would seem, I guess it's a natural progression, a natural growth path uh, of larger scale. You've already got this kind of like this asset, this team who's used to like placing tenants, used to like, oh, this part of town rents for this amount. Oh, the maintenance guy can drive out and we're going to pay this amount. So there's a lot of knowns and a lot of experience there where especially since you're kind of a boots on the ground investor to add another 100, you know, 125, 127 units, it seems natural and it seems like it's a, uh, you know, complementary to that team rather than if I were to go out and buy 127 units, I'm going to have to build that whole team myself. And I've got a right. different kind of team that's built for something different. So like when someone brings a flip to me, Dan, you want to flip this house? Yeah, we just plug it in, we slipstream, and it's like not a big deal. We'll close it out in a week, and it's like no big thing. So that's uh, right. that that kind of feels feels right to me. Yeah, yeah, we've been uh... – I mean, it's been a very natural progression, but um, we've been happy with how it's evolved and, and grown over the years. And just, you know, just excited for the future, too, you know, what, what's next. And, you know, it gets through this little kind of, uh, you know, kind of weird time with the coronavirus thing and work through all the fallout of that. But we're, we're still very optimistic about what things look like long term for real estate investment. And this will pose a lot of opportunity out there, too, for, for a lot of investors. I think, you know, the, the what happens in the next several months to, to a couple of years will be will still be a really good time for for whether it's fix and flip, you know, wholesaling, you know, buy and hold, you know, syndication. I th- think it's still going to be a very strong market. Yeah, I mean, I, I took a look at some of the economic data from the last, you know, when we had 2008, 9, and 10, we had systemic failure, meaning you know, underwriting was not proper so people were getting mortgages who shouldn't have had them so that like false demand in the market inflated prices beyond where they should have been uh and then we had like some demographic trends that came into play like the baby boomers suddenly didn't need the mcmansion sized houses and their kids weren't quite through college and off on their own to be buying houses themselves so there was like a demographic vacuum when you look at the ages out on the chart that kind of occurred at the same time as that systemic failure that was happening in 2008, 9, 10. So at the bottom of exactly. that market, uh, 2010, 2011, I don't have it in front of me, but the number of homes that was transacted on rolling 12-month period, I believe it was, was 3.45 million houses that closed. Uh, and okay. in fe- in February of 2020, that we just passed here, right before the coronavirus had a chance to really settle in economically, that is, uh, we had 5.7 million. And in January, we had 5.5 million. And a year before, in January 19, we had, I think it was 5 million flat, right around there, maybe 5.4, something like that. So even in the depth of the market, we still had, you know, 60% of the transaction volume in a country that was 10% smaller, so around 300 million people, we're about 330 million now. Um, so that tells me, right, there's still deals transacting if it's fix and flip and, and all those kind of things, even in like the most you know deep, dull real estate market that we lived through. So I would hope that even if there's a fall off that comes about in here where we have to deal with some unemployment, hotel workers, uh, maybe everyone is a germaphobe and no one goes back out to eat once this whole thing clears. I mean, it's it's kind of going to be interesting to see the shifts in humanity and culture itself and what kind of impact that might have on certain types of businesses versus others as we kind of have to reorganize a bit. But I think you're right. I think for the most part, we're going to see a lot of people who had, an, who had a plan on buying a house a year, two years, three years out – figure out a way to move those plans up to take advantage of these low interest rates. And like, I would hope that we're going to go into kind of like uh, a 2002, 2003 kind of real estate boom cycle, although maybe not quite as vibrant since people have to qualify for mortgages. I mean, that was kind of my, that's the story I tell myself to fall asleep last night. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, well, I think it helps to be positive and, and, you know, um, I, and really like, you know, like you said, I mean, a lot of the fundamentals are here. I mean, there's, there's going to be some corrections and it's going to, it's going to hit some people probably particularly hard and others not as much, but, but I think that, uh, yeah, I just, I think we're in much better position because, you know, it wasn't, you know, we weren't in a broken system. I mean, this is something that's out of everybody's control. So it's going to take, you know, kind of collective sacrifice and collective effort to, to get out of and recover from, but, but I think that, you know, things will come back. It's just a matter of how quick when they do, you know, and that could be six months, could be a couple of years. I mean, who knows, but it, but it seems like things will, will head in the right direction pretty quickly here. Cool. So let's, let's talk about Erie, right? I assume uh, all your properties are what, within an hour or two drive from where you're at now? Uh, everything's within about 20, 25 minutes of where, where we're oh, at. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. So even tighter circle. So if you were going to sell me on Erie, I'm living in Chicago. I grew up right outside of Philadelphia. I mean, how would you describe the market to me in a way that made me feel better about that market, even in light of the coronavirus economic situation that we're dealing with? Like, we'll keep the, the virus risk, you know, separate from the conversation for now. Sure. So I think the one, one of the big things about Erie, and, and I've said this for you know, 19 years, and I would say it to people that I, I worked with. I'd say it on every podcast I'm on the last couple of years, and, and you know, and, and I and I still believe I'm right. And and, and uh, I, I it's again, it's my opinion. Um, but I think that when you're in a tertiary market, you know, oftentimes like the markets that seem to make sense, like an Erie, isn't reliant on one employer. You know, so we we have a variety of employment opportunities. So healthcare, education, there's. You know, there's colleges, universities. There's also the largest medical college in the country, which is LECOM, uh, which is one of the big, uh, big employers in our area as well. So there's a lot of local economy. There's a lot of money coming from outside for those types of ventures. There's still a strong manufacturing base. Um, so there's a diversity in jobs. We are located. It's not as though Erie's in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, you're an hour and a half, two hours to Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and three hours from Toronto, so you're a lot closer to these major metropolitan areas, um, um, you know, as opposed to say maybe some other tertiary markets. Uh, you know, the other thing is that the cost of living is is lower. So if you took a kind of a blinded average of Erie and then the surrounding suburbs, it's about 80 percent of uh, the cost of living living of the national average. And and how this translates into real estate investment. So you know what we always say is that you're never going to um, gain from the uh, from an economic boom, but you're certainly going to, um, you know, hopefully protect yourself from from an economic bust. And and what that looks for, like for me today is that, okay, if, if a third of my tenants, you know, all of a sudden are on unemployment, I have 300 people un, unemployed out of out of a thousand, as an example. Um, well, <laughs> you know, our average rent in our portfolio is is roughly, I mean, you know, say $700 a month. And so on $700 a month of monthly rental income, if they're collecting unemployment, looks like there's going to be some, some federal stimulus money uh, getting passed today. Probably by the time your podcast gets released, it'll, um, you know, that'll have happened. But there's, there's these, you know, societal guardrails in place that, you know, somebody will be able to afford their basics in life as, as you know, utilities and shelter and food and and things like that, um, unemployment covers most of that. Now, there will be some disruption and, and maybe the timing of the rent that comes in and we may have to make, you know, we're not going to charge late fees and we, we allow people to pay, you know, maybe, um, you know, kind of throughout the month and we'll work with them a little bit. But um, by and large, you know, there should be very little disruption from the revenue standpoint of our business due to coronavirus. And as as uh, people go back to work, their jobs will come back and, and, and you know, things will get back to normal. So I think it's kind of going to, you know, take a little bit of uh, uh, creativity sometimes to work with people, but I don't see it just being, you know, unless there's something that comes out, you know, on a national level that says everybody's got a break from paying their bills. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't anticipate too much of a, too much of a hiccup here. And that's, so to me, if, if somebody's going to be sold on an area like Erie, you know, if I'm investing out of town, I, I personally I, I don't want to be in a market where it's hot because you know nobody saw coronavirus coming, and we all talked about oh hey, the market's booming and you know and, and you know this and that. But if you know if, if you're in the middle of a value add project in Atlanta, for instance, 
where you're counting on being able to push the rent to 250 or 300 dollars a month, um, I would I would be a little nervous because your the success of your project is then contingent on you being able to drive up the rents. And if we're in the middle of a you know this kind of crazy economic time, that might be a little bit more of a challenge to do. Um, but but you know our um, you know we're able to push rents, but we're not you know it, we're not going to buy something that's contingent on pushing something to an unrealistic, uh, you know, an un- unrealistic, unsustainable level. And so maybe that's just kind of the conservative nature of, of the Rust Belt and towns like ours. But, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, there are, there's absolutely 100% people suffering in our town right now. It's not as though there's not. But I think that, you know, there's that, that ability to still cover your basic needs financially when the world kind of goes sideways. Yeah, and as you described the location, I'm thinking, you know, at, at first, I'm going to be honest, like Erie felt like the other side of the world because when I grew up and we looked at a map in second grade, Erie was like the complete other side of the state from uh, Pennsylvania where we were, so it felt like the other side of the yeah. world. But as you describe it, I put myself in, in your shoes and say, oh, yeah, the location. And plus, you guys are right on Lake Erie. I mean, that, are there like little beachfronts and stuff and like kind of high rises down there? What's, what's the lakefront look like in Erie, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, so Presque Isle State Park is one of the heaviest trafficked state parks in the country. So it's a little known gem that, I mean, we get a ton of like summertime tourism from, you know, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, you know, a lot of Canadians come into town. Um, for the beachfront. So, you know, Presque Isles, you know, um, I, I, people are going to kill me for getting it wrong, but I think it's like uh, it's seven miles long. So you can, you can go the route like six and a half, seven miles on one side and then loop around and, and it brings you back on the other side. But it's it sandy beaches and, and beautiful sunsets. Um, there's a lot of development going on in downtown Erie and along the bayfront. So we have this beautiful waterfront that used to be kind of dominated by like old smokestack, you know, manufacturing facilities that, you know, if you think back in the 1950s and, you know, uh, around that time where it was just dumping pollution, into, you know, and, and that was the waterfront. Well, now that that's, you know, that's changing into, you know, a lot more uh, development and, you know, retail and, and office space and, and just things to, to really utilize that, that waterfront as, as, you know, uh, a draw for tourists, but also for the folks that want li- to like work and live uh, downtown. I mean, they want to, you know, they want to live there and not like, looking at the back of an alley or something like that. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's a, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the most like a uh, vibrant place in the world. I, I hate to, can't, can't compare it to say a Portland, Oregon or a Nashville, Tennessee, but, but it's a, but it's a nice little city, kind of a, kind of a hidden gem, um, you know, uh, that that's out there. So we really, really enjoy being here and the cost of living is so low. So you can, you can live like a king in a small town and, and, uh, and then travel the world and see everything else that that you want to, um, without having to pay, you know, uh, pay an arm and a leg to live here. Yeah, we uh, until I moved to Chicago five years ago, being near my daughter, she was out here since you know uh, me and her mom went our separate ways, you know, years and years ago from Philly. But uh, I never would have thought until I moved out here in 2015, like living on the lake. So I live on the lakefront and I imagine it's kind of like eerie. It's like I look out the window and there's beaches out here. It's like who ever thought Chicago was like a beach town, but that's how it is in the summertime. Um, I think I heard Sam Zell, one of his earlier uh market strategies and i don't know if that carried through uh i don't think it did all the way until his recent years but he was kind of a tertiary market investor because he felt like he could get i think it was like 12 or 15 percent cash on cash return by buying multifamily stuff 100 150 unit on up um multifamily housing apartment buildings in these tertiary markets without the kind of competition that drives us to like you know six six percent cap rates in a city like chicago with huge tax risk the way that the the situation is what uh what are the expected cash you know cash on cash returns if you were going to be excited about a you know the the deal you're looking at for multifamily sure i mean i think you know we're generally like if it's a multifamily deal um, they're generally trading right now you know where they were until i mean Today it's a little little bit of a standstill, but you know they were trading in the in the, in the sevens and eights. Um, you know I'd like to I like to have some juice in the deal. I, I you know I don't want that to be a hard seven where there's no you know where there's no upside. Yeah. Um, so as an example, you know we're right now uh, the 127 units that we have under contract. Um, it, it's a you know it's a solid eight cap with a lot of room to push the rents, a lot of room to 
kind of uh, the expenses were generally in line, but but just basically normalize the revenue. Even even with the market going the way it is, we still believe that there's that there's some uh, potential upside there um, across the board. So um, so being able to take say a seven or an eight cap and turn that into a you know turn that into something much better. So. Um, you know, if we're going to – so, like, in our multifamily deals, everybody, you know, they, they talk about providing preferred returns and things like that. You know, I I, um, I don't love to do the extra math. I think it's just, like so, – so the thing that kind of – I don't say it concerns me, but I see a lot of deals out there and people promise a, a preferred return. But the question is, are your limited partners actually receiving – uh, pay, uh, you know, payback. I mean, it's great to think that you're you're going to be the first to get paid, but you know, um, I have a somebody I, I uh, one of my coaching students in real estate. She's she lives out in LA and and uh, was telling me a few weeks back that she's invested in two deals um, where there's pre- preferred returns, and one she's been in for a year, and the other a year and a half, and says. Well, you know, I, I the one has paid me about a thousand dollars so far, and the other one I, I oh, haven't paid anything. But it's, but it's a preferred return, and so so for me, I, I my model is like, look, we're going to do a straight split. You know, it, it, it could vary by deal, but it could be you know eighty twenty, seventy five twenty five, something along those lines. And uh, we you know we have our investors expect to get paid starting Q one, and you know we're we're going to be able to operate a deal in, in the sense that there's going to be net profit to distribute, and they should expect at least an eight percent annualized return. Um, you know, if it's a value add play, um, that'll go up and that'll go up significantly, you know, uh, after a couple of years. But that's the way we try to model it. Not, you know, not to really do any crazy waterfall structures, not really do any crazy, um, you know, anything that's too hard to explain or too hard for them, them to understand. It just, it just like make the math as easy as possible and, and get people excited about having a good, stable, predictable return. And, and I don't think it's any more, di- shouldn't be any more difficult than that. Do you guys pay monthly to your investors or quarterly? Well, we do quarterly. I, I do have a couple, uh, my wife and I do have a couple joint venture properties where uh, the, the, you know, the investment was made in terms of debt. So they're getting, those guys are getting paid out monthly, but there's, there's a few of those, but as far as the syndications are concerned, it, it's paid quarterly, so we'll do uh, the quarterly distributions. Usually, have our numbers reconciled, you know, within the week or two at, at the close of the quarter, and um, you know, we we see where you know see where things fall. If we can over over distribute, we do. We sort of learn to uh, to hold back sometimes if we have that extra cash just to just to be able to make sure that we provide that predictability for, for our investors. I think it's much better to you know provide say an eight percent annualized return if you're just paying that out. You know, the same amount every quarter, that's better than having it be wildly volatile, you know, quarter over quarter. Just want to give people that kind of reassurance and that that kind of stability and predictability, as I mentioned. Yeah, and I mentioned, I mean, it feels good, certainly like certain REITs I own and, and companies in the stock market, you know, your dividend and the dividend does not wildly fluctuate. I mean, the price might wildly fluctuate. But at the end of the year, right. you read an annual report, and you can see if there's some extra cash in there. There's a little bit of little bit of prudence there, so I could definitely see the value from either side of the table of keeping that eight percent kind of consistent, right? Yep, for sure. Your hold period on these, Jason? You said you don't like to sell anything. So when you have syndicated uh, other people's funds, are they also yep. in it for the long haul, or how does that work? Yeah, so we um, so generally for the syndications, we'll have a ten-year timeline um, that is in line with um, generally the term of the loan that we're um, that we've entered into. Um, you know, we're seeking agency debt, so if it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan you know, with a ten-year term, we'll, we'll generally have that be the horizon to reevaluate the deal. So we'll look at market conditions, we'll look at how the property's performed, and we'll make that determination: do we sell that? Um, do we refinance that? And, and be able to have some sort of capital event where we, you know, give people, uh, uh, you know, some 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 cash back. Um, so so we'll reevaluate those at ten years. That that's the expected hold period. And so if somebody wants out and they want to go their separate ways, that that's fine. And if they want to uh, um, you know, stay in the deal, but but uh, you know maybe on a more limited basis, that's that's going to be evaluated on a on a deal by deal uh, situation, just you know as they come up. And I think one of one of the things that uh, my wife and I and, and our uh, partner in this that you know we think that hey if it's if it's been good to us long term and it's and it's run well you know if it's if it's not broke why fix it but 
at the same time, it's hard to predict what type of opportunities and things will be out there. You know, if you if you bought something say for 10 million and have a chance to sell it for 20 million, you know, it might not be a bad day to take take a payday or to Fair enough. or to refinance, get get some cash out tax free and uh, and keep it rolling, right? So so I think you just have to you just have to look at the entirety of of the situation of the partnership of of the local economy and just see where everybody's at and, and just you know kind of take that survey, take it to heart and really try to, you know, try to do the best thing for, for, uh, uh, for the partnership, at, you know, when, when that time frame comes. So ha- how many properties have you sold over the years? Um, I have sold about, uh, so we've not sold any of our syndic- uh, properties we've syndicated, but um, I've sold about 10 properties that, uh, uh, you know, multifamily properties that we bought. And um, as one of our large local employers has expanded, um, I've been the beneficiary of, of kind of standing in the path of progress. So where they're, where they're <laughs> buying property to, you know, to construct new office space or create more green space, uh, you know, we've been able to sell to, to, uh, um, that, that in this case was Erie Insurance and, um, really, um, you know, and re- really benefited from that. Um, but I guess I'll caveat that I have sold off a lot of our smaller, like, uh, singles and doubles and, and things like that and maybe some, Tougher areas. Um, I've, I've kind of packaged a bunch of things and sold them via land contract to uh, to a couple of different up and coming investors, and really try to you know, be a mentor to them and get them started on the right path. So um, ultimately, I still own it until the land contract uh, you know um, runs its course. But um, but that that that's was like the beginning of the exit strategy for a lot of for a lot of those types of properties. And was it mostly troubling properties? They were causing a headache. Like you sound like such a buy and hold forever kind of guy. That's why I'm kind of down this line of questioning. It's like, well, what would cause Jason Pirro to actually want to sell these off? I mean, what was like the motivator yeah. in those besides Erie in, insurance? Well, yeah. Well, I think the, the key for like a lot of the, the smaller stuff, I mean, one hand, you know, I, I think about, well, how do I exit out of some of these properties and why would I sell them? I think, you know, we were I, I, at the time. I was having some trouble with scaling the business appropriately to um, to handle, on one hand, say maybe you know a handful of units in a like a um, I'll say a tougher part of town. I mean, Erie's Erie's you know only so big and it's only so tough, so it's um, it's not like it was that bad. But you switching gears from that to say a large like higher end like you know, thirty unit townhome complex and. You just found that from like a property management perspective, a, a maintenance perspective, really hard to standardize when there's like different types of properties in play, and and so and then there was a lot more running around. So sort of in the like in a, in a way of being efficient, um, so look if I can take these off our plate, you know that that helps the daily operations. Uh, the other side of it is to be able to give those properties the proper attention. Um, you know, I think it's something that has to be a lot more hands-on. And so um, I was able to then create that predictable stream of income as opposed to the volatility that can sometimes come with like a bunch of like smaller scattered types of properties. So, you know, if you have 50 duplexes, there's going to be a lot more volatility as opposed to like one 100 unit complex. And, um, and the thing is, it's one thing if that's all you do is run like one particular type of property, but it was, it was getting to pose its challenges in terms of like, Hey, we're you know we're we're over here at this one portfolio, and now we're switching gears to go over this other other portfolio, and that's just and, and I I woke up and said, well, you know what? And our long if our long term goal is to syndicate and really you know start moving, keep moving into better properties, better areas, better everything, then we really need to start thinking about disposing of some of the smaller stuff. And and uh, I don't have any second thoughts about it at all. It's been very beneficial to the guys that have uh, purchased it from us, but also um, for us to be able to free up that time and energy to move into new, into new adventures. Yeah, it makes sense. I feel like I'm personally at the same spot, although I'm not moving into the, the bigger portfolios and kind of stepping up. Uh, it's the growth in our single family, you know, flipping business that has caused me to look at my portfolio more as a distraction uh, but uh, the tax benefits of hanging on to this stuff kind of has me in that conundrum of of wanting to hang on, you know, a little bit longer. So I'm I'm kind of torn, even though my my numbers are way smaller than what you've got on a plate. I I can understand the distraction factor being very important in deciding to sell off a couple of the properties. Yep, no, that's cool. for sure. And that's it. yeah, it's just about I think 
when I realized you had to be open to evolving your business plan, you know, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with selling something and taking a profit, right? And selling something so you free up your your time and energy to to move into other areas. I mean, there's sometimes only so much you can do in a day, and something something's going to suffer um, because you can't get to everything. So. Cool. So Jason, uh, you know, over the years, maybe, maybe you've recommended some books to some of the people you do some coaching or maybe some like really impactful books that would jump to mind, uh, that you would recommend to other people, maybe one or two, anything pop, uh, pop up. Yeah. 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 Um, two books that I, I love that I, I recommend uh, every chance I get. The first is poor Charlie's almanac. So that's a collection of speeches and talks by Charlie Munger. Um, you know, so he's, he's the long time, long term vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. So everybody talks about, you know, um, Warren Buffett, but this is, you know, he's Warren Buffett's right hand man. So it's a, it's a, it's a big book and it's, it's super entertaining and it just gives you kind of a, just a mindset for how to approach business, how to approach your investments and, and just really help me to start thinking about, um, you know, my, my business in a different way. So I, I usually kind of reread that once every year and a half or so, and, and uh, I get a lot out of it. And then uh, the other book that I recommend a lot is The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. So Darren used to he's a personal development coach and a um, you know kind of a, a guru uh, guy, but he, he was the publisher of Success Magazine. And, and the whole premise of the book is you know, it's about like it's not all the the big massive action and the big huge things that add up, but it's the countless like you know small choices that really make the biggest difference at at the end of the day so the premise of just like the small daily choices you make you know is what compounds into the massive success that you're looking for at the end of the line nice i uh i have both of those on my bookshelf both were impactful i'm gonna awesome. i'm gonna pull down charlie's uh poor charlie's almanac again and have to give that another read because it was probably three or four years since i have read it and I do, I do probably, or I have read, uh, the snowball, I think twice, uh, about Warren Buffett. And he credits, and if you really read and follow Warren Buffett a lot, like Warren Buffett is not Warren Buffett without, uh, Charlie Munger's influence throughout the years. So the conversation that Charlie exactly. and Warren were having, I mean, Warren kind of gets the spotlight. He's the larger shareholder in Berkshire, but yeah, without, without Charlie, there was, never going to be a Warren Buffett. I I don't think so. I mean, right. Yeah. Cool. So if you could go back and share with yourself, uh, you know, the crown jewel of wisdom, maybe while you were still doing in medical sales and, and you were at property or unit door number 20 to 30, what would the crown jewel of wisdom be, Jason? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think one of the, one, one of the things that would have, um, if I could go back then, it would just be to to slow down and trust the process. That you know, have faith that the plan's going to work. Um, you know, I think I I was obsessed at that time to a fault of just go 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 and trying to you know just trying to set the world on fire and you know I, I don't know prove something to no one I guess, but just trying you know, just trying to be just trying to say well I'm gonna I'm gonna have all these units and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna make all this money, but really didn't have a purpose. And I just think that you know, slowing down and, and really, you know, creating you know, more defined goals and trying to have that, that, that kind of all around work life, you know, mental balance um, would go much further. And I, and I think I, I mean, we're always as entrepreneurs kind of geared towards, you know, go, go, go and always be creating and things like that. But, um, but I feel now, you know, I, I have a much better balance in terms of, um, you know, the time I spend with my wife, the time I spend with my kids, you know, being, you know, being a good friend to my friends and, and just, you know, but still giving the business the, the, you know, the attention it needs. And so, um, I just think it was, it was definitely very one-sided, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. I wonder if some of that just comes with maturity and, and age. I, I think I feel like that same spot, you know, I might even say the same thing to myself, but, uh, but yeah, it's really good really good to be able to make sure maybe as we mature and we get the experience, we start to figure out what is important. So you know, which levers you got to focus on to kind of get the result. But early on, when you don't know, you got to run around and hit all the levers. I mean, you kind of got to be like a headless right. chicken on fire a little bit, but uh, yeah, I wish, I wish you could take the experience back and, and start over. I mean, who, who knows, right? But um, <laughs> I di I digress. Yeah. So Jason, uh, is there is there anywhere if anyone wants to get some more information or, or contact you that they should go? 
Absolutely. Uh, they can hit me up on my website. That's perorealestate.com. Um, you know, drop me an email. Uh, they can connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook. It's fine. And then if anybody wants to hop on a quick, you know, 10, 15 minute strategy call, uh, they can book time with me, um, through my Calendly link, which is calendly.com forward slash Jason Perro. All right, cool. Hey, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to share with me and the listeners of the wisdom. I, I have like a couple pages of notes here. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, I hope that you and your family and everybody in, in your town stay safe. And of course, the same for everybody in the country here as we get through this. But yeah, thank thank you for coming on the show, Jason. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, it was a pleasure and I had a lot of fun with it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the REI Diamond Show. Coming up on the next episode is a discussion with Brett Swartz and I on how to defer taxes on gains from any highly appreciated asset. Imagine selling a business and making a $10 million profit. There's no 1031 exchange for selling a business. It, it would be nice. Wouldn't you just love to have a strategy to turn right around and invest that entire $10 million into a variety of assets without first having to shell out that large percentage in state and federal taxes. That's the power of the Deferred Sales Trust and the topic of the next episode, so you want to make sure to tune in and catch that one. Do you have a deal for sale? Do you need a buyer now? We have sold and settled 44 houses year to date and have 99 more in our inventory. We are a large volume shop and we are still looking for more deals. Unlike many investors who are now corona restricted as a result of hard money lenders across the U.S. pushing pause on funding any more deals, we are a well-funded company through private sources, private resources, and long since established lines of credit with multiple banks, multiple lenders, and we are in big time buy mode. So if you have a deal, please either reply to my email or hit me up directly using the form at reidiamonds.com. I personally monitor both of those communication methods and pride myself on rapid responses. In other words, I'll make the decision quickly and get right back to you. Are you an accredited investor currently in the market for passive real estate investments that are completely hands-off, highly profitable, and return capital in a short time window, usually about 6 to 12 months or less? If so, head over to fundrehabdeals.com. This is how you can passively participate in my deal flow here at Diamond Equity. We are at the end, my friend. I will catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.